coming up on The Sporting Chef. Today, it's San Diego's hottest food ticket. And John McGannon, Hans Hummel, C-Dub, Melissa Bachman, Stacey Harris, and, as always, Buddy. What do you get when you find the best fish in game chefs? Cookbook authors, award winners, fishmongers, outdoor experts, and put them on the fastest half hour on outdoor television. Hosted by one of America's best known wild game chefs, Scott Lacey, the sporting chef. Brought to you by Camp Chef, the way to cook outdoors. Now, anyone that's ever watched the Sporting Chef TV show knows about Tommy Gomes. Tommy is our resident fishmonger. He is the, the, the man behind the marketing side, anyway, at, at Cat, uh, Catalina Offshore Products. Yeah. San Diego, what am I doing here tonight? You wrote me into something. What's the deal? We're, we're doing what's called Collaboration Kitchen, and we gather the top chefs, and unfortunately they were all busy, so we got a hold of Scott, and he came into town. What we're doing tonight is uh, once a month we raise money for people around the, the city of San Diego, underprivileged children and stuff like that, and tonight we're raising money for San Diego Oceans Foundation. It's a nonprofit group of young people who are trying to clean up our bays, estuaries, and try and do the right thing and, and educate people on what's going on locally with our ocean today. And with any stroke of luck, we're going to have a few people that are going to actually show up here to eat this stuff. This is a very casual evening. I'm going to do five courses of stuff. stuff. We'll talk about that. I've got some of Tommy's incredible fish, shellfish, oysters. We'll kind of get more into the menu after that. But yeah, but the deal is, it's very casual. It's Pe super casual. Uh, during the show, we're, we got a couple of other sponsors that are coming in, and we're going to break down a yellowtail so people can get up and stretch their legs. We're going to do some sushi over there. And basically, uh, we have no roll checklist or anything. We're just going to roll with it and have some fun and eat some good food. And basically, the only way I can keep people awake for this long is to have them getting up and down, eating, drinking, the whole deal. We'll get to more of that, but first, I want you to check out John McGannon with his tip on dry aging. Okay, Scott. So this is the single most important fact that all of your waterfowlers need to know. Migratory birds, your ducks and your geese, have a process called reoxygenation. It is this process that allows these birds to fly at 20,000 feet for hundreds of miles at a time. The excess blood, it has twice the amount of blood than it does a land animal, and this extra blood keeps its heart and its lungs pumping and going nice and smooth so it doesn't stress out under these long flights. The capillary blood that is inside of these muscle tissues and, and all animals is the broken down byproduct of what that animal has consumed. So if you're a duck and you're eating aquatic plant life out of the bottom of a muddy slough, well, and then somebody consumes that flesh in a very fresh state, it's gonna be very evident in the flavor and that duck is gonna taste like the bottom of a muddy slough. We've all pretty much uh, have experienced that. This is where the habanero teriyaki honey sake soy glaze things comes in. These are two mallards that I've dry aged for five days. And if you take a look, this probably has, oh, I would say a half a cup of motor oil thick capillary blood. Now, if you just go ahead and take this duck out of your freezer and defrost it and try to cook it in this state, it's going to taste like the bottom of a muddy slough. Once you get this blood out of there, now, it's got a two-fold benefit. One, you're breaking down the high-intense fiber structure of that muscle tissue. And two, you're getting rid of the aggressive flavor from the capillary blood. If you brine a fresh piece of waterfowl, then you're basically locking in all of that capillary blood, and that is not what we want to do. So remember, dry age your beef, your deer, your elk, and your ducks and your geese. And it also needs to be done while it's in its whole stage. What I like to do, one last thing, is I cut the backs out, which creates an exit port and allows that blood to drain out, giving you a very tender, mild and delicate piece of waterfowl. I think you should give it a try. You will never change your ways when it comes to your ducks and geese. Let me tell you the best part about tonight's deal, the Collaboration Kitchen, is I'm doing five dishes, but I'm just doing five little plates. I've got all these other folks back here, they're gonna basically get the menu out to everyone else. Um, I'm gonna start off with one of my favorites, smoked quail, and we've done smoked quail on the Sporting Chefs show before. 
Um, smoked quail on lemony, mustardy greens. Uh, I've got a low country oyster roast. My tribute to South Carolina. We're gonna go kind of low country here in uh, Southern California tonight. Beautiful oysters, just in their own liquor that have just been roasted enough so they just crack open, a little bit of Tabasco sauce. Then it's grouper. Grouper is a very, very southern fish, but fortunately, Catalina Offshore Products is one of the only places that I know of that you can get good, fresh Sea of Cortez grouper here on this side of the country. If you've been to South Carolina, no doubt you've had grouper chunks, which is a fried hunk of grouper. This is gonna be lightly dusted in masa flour, so it's gonna give it kind of that tortilla flavor on the outside, the corn tortilla flavor on the outside. It has some pepper slaw, a little bit of slaw dressing on top, garnished. Like I said, these guys are doing all the work. The big finish for me is going to be the shrimp and grits. Uh, and for those of you that don't understand grits, think warm, cheesy, creamy polenta, which is just, it's just a cornmeal. It's got milk, it's got chicken stock, it's got a gigantic amount of cheese. The shrimp is just cooked. The stock is made with shrimp shells. You're gonna love it. I know there's something else I'm doing, but I'll get to that. In the meantime, I want you to check out this tip on how to make your fish in game last longer. And it's all about how you package it. You know, the Food Saver Game Saver vacuum units are extremely versatile. It's not just about making your fishing game last as long as possible. Let's say you make a big pot of stew and you want to freeze it so that you can use it all year long or maybe you want to take it camping with you. These portions here, this is the portion pouch, it's split in two here. Um, and what I like to do with that is I like to take stews, this is a paella rice that I've got that's good for about two portions. And all you have to do to revive it, to bring it back to life, is to drop it into boiling water. So as long as you're making stew, you might as well make a big batch of stew, freeze it in the portions you like in either the bronze, silver, or this beautiful titanium food saver game saver. And for more information, check out foodsaver.com. Coming up next, there's a ton of stuff going on here in San Diego, and Hans and C-Dub, Melissa, Stacy, and Buddy. Stay right here.
Okay, so while Tommy is out there talking to everybody else, let me tell you about that first course. The first course is the smoked quail. It was brined in just a basic salt water brine with a little bit of sugar and some orange juice and some fresh ginger. Brined, smoked, not overcooked. It went on some greens. And again, these guys here, these guys did all the work on some lemony greens with a Dijon and lemony mustard vinaigrette. Um, the greens were kale, baby spinach. We put a little different microgreens on top. And when I say we, of course, I mean them. All right, coming up next, it's Hans and C-Dub making snacking sticks. All right, Scott, today we are making uh, cracked pepper and garlic snack and sticks by High Mountain. C-Dub already has it pre-measured. Um, each pack comes with cure, seasoning, um, the mixing chart. Um, he's gonna go ahead and mix this by hand. Um, we've got the collagen casings, and we're gonna do uh, put it here in our stuffer. Um, each kid will do 22 pounds of meat. Um, you know, the, th the, better, the best thing about doing it on your own is that it's economical. Um, you know, you go to the store, you may be spending 13 bucks a pound on snack and sticks. Here you can do a whole lot more than that for a whole lot less. Well, and uh, also, Hans, with our venison, we can use some of those, that grinding meat that we don't right. want in our steaks and roasts. Exactly. And it's got too much sinew in it for jerky, but put it through the grinder and uh, this makes a perfect snack. So are you ready to load? Let's, let's do it. Okay, let's tip this back. We'll get that in there. And this stuffer is just so nice to work with as far as loading it. Um, and what I've got here are the collagen casings. These are edible. Um, they come with every pack. Uh, there's uh, four strands in each one. They'll do a total of 22 pounds of meat. Okay, I've got it right to the end there, so okay. we're ready to stuff. Okay, we've got the casing tied on here on the end. We've got it loaded. Uh, one little tip is to add some uh, oil on there to help the casing slip on. See, Dub, should we get her going? Let, let's get her stuff. Okay. Just want to apply some even pressure here. Just let it work its way out. And you can do this one person, but it really helps when we do it with two. And okay. there we are, right, right to the, the end. end of our casing. We can add more casing. We're just going to keep going until we're going. done. And then tie her off, and here we go. We'll just put that right in your smoker or your oven. Be done in about two hours. Okay, if you haven't had a low country oyster roast, let me tell you. you normally, and they do this in South Carolina, that's where I've had it. You build a big fire, get a bunch of coals, and then on top of that bed of coals, you just put a, a grate or a rack on top, and you just shovel these fresh oysters on top of it, cover it with wet burlap, and it steams in its own juices and the burlap. And then once they've started to open, you crack them open the rest of the way. And where I see that is on a big countertop height table with a hole in the middle. It's a plywood table. They shovel the, sh the oysters on top. You put a little hot sauce on it and eat it with saltine crackers. And that's the whole deal. We're doing it a little bit different here, but it, the concept is basically the same. You can also do it in a skillet, um, just a cast iron skillet. It, put some oysters in there, a little bit of beer inside to give it some moisture, cover it up, let it steam right on top of the stove top or in the oven. That's your oyster roast. This is Melissa Bachman. There's a couple things that most of us have in common. We like seeing things blow up, especially when they're in slow motion. And most of us, well, we don't do enough shooting at the range. So I decided to combine those two, and I'm gonna be out shooting household items all in slow motion.
Up next, it's Grouper, Shrimp and Grits, Stacy Harris, and Buddy. Welcome back to The Sporting Chef. I'm Scott Laysath, and I'm here in San Diego at the Collaboration Kitchen, a collaborative effort of some of San Diego's best chefs and me and this great crew here. Um, I'm telling you, the next course is going to be grouper. And this grouper is going to be lightly dusted in masa flour. Uh, it's one of my favorite ways to dust fish. Masa flour is what they make corn tortillas out of. It's going to give you that corn tortilla flavor. If you take half masa flour and half regular flour, it's still going to make a nice crust on the outside. Make sure you season it with salt and pepper. It's going to go on a bed of warm pepper slaw with a little bit of coleslaw dressing. And then I've got a little tomato cilantro thing that goes on top. Of course, they're doing all the work. And next up is my favorite Southern gal. It's Stacy Harris. Today, I'm gonna to be making a brined and smoked turkey breast. Before you smoke the turkey, you're gonna to need to brine it. They are so active, turkeys are, they forage all day, they don't have a lot of fat, and they need to get tender, and how to do that is to brine it. The first thing you're gonna do is to pour some water and vinegar, about a cup of water to a cup of vinegar, um, and I have apple cider vinegar into a pot, and then we're gonna put a couple of other ingredients in with it. Brining with is mainly used as a way to preserve food. But now that we have refrigeration and ways to preserve food, we just use it for flavor. A basic brine is one gallon of water to one cup of kosher salt. And really you can just use that, but this is a time to put in a lot of other elements, like a bay leaf, which I'm about to add to this um, mixture, some salt, brown sugar, some garlic, and you got it made. So I'm just gonna put it right in here. Stir it up. Kosher salt is not gonna dissolve in cold water. As soon as this dissolves, you're gonna add the rest of the water to it. You're gonna let it cool, and then you're gonna add your turkey breast and refrigerate it for about 24 hours. I've been brining my turkey for 24 hours. 
and it looks like it is ready. It's got a little bit of color to it, and normally it wouldn't, but I like to use this apple cider vinegar, and sometimes the vinegar will look like it's cooked it, but it really hasn't. I have a dry rub here, and I'm leaving one of the ingredients out, and that is salt, because I have enough salt in my brine and my meat is plenty salty. So I'm gonna add some cayenne, just a little bit. I'm adding quite a bit of pepper, some garlic powder, some cumin, and some paprika. All right, you can look at these turkeys and you can see that they don't look like chicken. They don't have any of that yellow fat running through them. All right, but I'm gonna add some fat. I'm gonna add some bacon to this. I'm about to wrap some bacon around this and we're gonna have a little bit of smoked bacon with our smoked turkey. Now I'm heading out to put this in the smoker. Try it on the rack. My turkey's done. It smells great, it's gonna taste great. I bring my turkey to an internal temperature of about 150 degrees. I let it rest for about 10, 15 minutes and it'll continue to cook during that time. And then you can slice it up and eat it and boy, are you gonna be excited. It's a wonderful turkey. Who doesn't love Stacy Harris, my favorite Southern gal? You know, what she does is incredible with, with her sustainable foods. She raises chickens. She homeschools seven kids. She does it all. She's Wonder Woman, and I'm not. But you know what? She does the Southern thing, and these guys are doing shrimp and grits. Um, grits are one of my all-time favorite comfort foods. Um, the real grits that I've had the first time, it was in Charleston, South Carolina, at a restaurant called Magnolia's. Um, and that's where I was first introduced to the real best shrimp and grits in the world. It's cheesy, it's creamy, it's like soft polenta. There's gonna be some, uh, there's bacon that the shrimp's been cooked in. There's a nice stock. You take the shrimp shells, don't waste shrimp shells. Put them into a stock pot with celery, carrot, onion, put some cold water on top, bring it to a boil, and then just let it simmer. Strain it out after about 30, 45 minutes. You don't wanna leave those shells in for a long time. And then just take it all out and then reduce that stock. And it's gonna have this intense shrimp flavor. That's going into the sauce. Um, there's a little bit of tomato in there. It's gonna finish with butter, so the sauce is nice and creamy. Shrimp and grits. I want you to hear from a few other people here on how they enjoy the collaboration kitchen here in San Diego. And then we've got Buddy. You know Buddy. Hey Buddy, do what it is you do. Hey, it's Buddy T, and we're gonna talk onion rings. I went and I took one egg to every, about a cup of buttermilk, mix that up, and I used one cup of flour, one cup of regular breadcrumbs, and one cup of panko breadcrumbs. I'm gonna put a teaspoon of bacon powder in there with it. Go ahead and flour them onions, put it in that buttermilk egg batter, then you go to the Trinity. Go ahead and put a few of them in there. All right, we'll be right back whenever it's all fried up for you. A couple of important things when you're making these. You want to cut them about a quarter of an inch thick. Now, whenever I make these up, after they got that bread crumb coating on them, I put them in a the refrigerator for 30 minutes or an hour. It helps that stuff set up. Okay, Scott, well, you're a long way from Texas, and that's too bad, because these are mine. Go ahead and make you up your own batch. Great food, great people, and a very worthwhile cause. Stick around, there's more to come from the Collaboration Kitchen.
So the party is winding down here at the Collaboration Kitchen in San Diego. Um, apparently, they thought the food was okay. Nobody got sick. We had a ton to eat. All this Catalina Offshore products, great fresh stuff. And if you go to CatalinaOP.com, you can have this very same fish and shellfish overnighted to your house. I don't care where you live. And of course, I'm gonna have a little earthquake cab to go with mine because now it's my turn. Big thanks to all of my friends that helped out on the show today. Besides Tommy Gomes and Catalina Offshore Products, we've got John McGannon with his dry aging tips, Hans and C-Dub doing their snack and sticks, Melissa Bachman, Stacy Harris, and then there's always Buddy. If you want to see the clips of all these people that were on the show, make sure you check out SportingChef.com. I'm Scott Laseth, The Sporting Chef. I appreciate you watching, and we hope to see you next week.